today as a part of our uh, discussion we are going to uh, discuss the life cycle of schistosoma hematobium a parasite belonging to the flatworm category or the phylum platyhelminthes so let's get started now Cystosoma hematobium is belonging to the kingdom Animalia, phylum Platyhelminthes, class Trematoda. Trematoda uh, individuals are generally called flukes. You know very well that Platyhelminthes is having three kinds of uh, organisms, Terbillarians, Trematodes and Cystodes. So our, this parasite, Cystosoma hematobium is belonging to the class Trematoda and it is called generally a blood fluke. It is belonging to the order uh, Diplostomida, family Cystosomatidae, and the genus Cystosoma. And we are going to discuss the species that is Cystosoma hematobium. Cystosoma hematobium, the blood fluke, which lives uh, actually in the uh, pelvic veins of human beings, and it was discovered by a notable scientist, Bill Hertz, in the year 1851. You may be knowing very well about this disease. This disease is uh, actually called very much a neglected disease in the tropical region and more than 270 million people are suffering from this disease. That means one in every 12 persons uh, are, uh, is suffering from this particular cystosomiasis. It is called urinary blood fluke. Several blood flukes are there but uh, this belongs to the category of urinary blood fluke because uh, it uh, causes bleeding in urine and uh, such a manifestation is called uh, hematuria. So, blood in urine, hematuria was uh, earlier detected by Egyptians uh, and recorded 5000 years ago. So, I am going to describe the morphology of Cystosoma hematobium in the coming slides. Okay. So, we have seen the classification, Animalia is the kingdom, Platyhelminthes is the phylum, Trimetoda is the class and Diplostomida is order and Cystosoma today is the family and Cystosoma is the genus, okay. Cystosomae are having many species, many species of which three are very, very, very important. So, Cystosoma japanicum, Cystosoma mansoni, Cystosoma hematobium. These are human Cystosomae. So, these three are having a greater significance to discuss in medical biology. Cystosoma japanicum is, is a, a very very intensive uh, parasite and it is uh, spread to many parts of the world especially in the far east regions, uh, countries like China, Philippines, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. Cystosoma mansoni occurs in the posterior mesenteric uh, veins uh, in our body as uh, Cystosoma japanicum occurs in anterior mesenteric veins. Anterior part of the abdomen or uh, very close to small intestine, Cystosoma japanicum is present and uh, very close to the large intestine, Cystosoma mansoni is present and Cystosoma mansoni is prevalent in the case of uh, African countries, Middle East countries, Caribbean countries and Brazil, Venezuela, Suriname, etc. Uh, this particular parasite uh, it is uh, living very close to intestine in the blood vessels and Cystosoma hematobium. Cystosoma hematobium is uh, quite distinctive uh, when we compare the about two parasites because it lives in the pelvic veins. These pelvic veins are very very close to urinary bladder. Urinary bladder. So as a result of living very close to urinary bladder and the walls of urinary bladder are also very very thin and uh, because in the capillaries, uh, because of the passage of the spiny eggs and it causes bleeding and su such bleeding in urine is actually called hematuria and it is also occurring in African countries, Middle East countries and uh, Asian countries also. So what is very significant about uh, Cystosoma hematobium is, Cystosoma hematobium is uh, one of the causes for bladder cancer, bladder cancer. So, bladder cancer causative agent is Cystosoma hematobium. Okay, let us discuss uh, these three species uh, up to some extent. Cystosoma japanicum occurs, as I mentioned earlier, in the anterior mesenteric veins. 
and as I have already mentioned in the previous class that it is the most infectious uh, uh, parasite. So of the three, it is the most dangerous and it is the most infectious parasite. Its um, infection range is also very, very wide, infecting many species of wild animals, not only the human beings, it is also infecting many mammalian species, carnivore species of mammals, rodent species and human being, insectivore species of mammals, uh, and then cattle of mammals. So, Cystosoma japanicum is having a wide range of infecting in mammalian species. That's why it is very, very dangerous. And it is uh, looking yellow, yellowish or yellowish brown in color. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it is uh, very much uh, spreading in Far East countries such as China, Philippines, Indonesia, South Asia, and also South Asia. So, uh, what is the main source of infection of this uh, parasite? It is the main culprit is water. Typically, in these countries, what I have earlier mentioned, and there is a custom of using water for ablution. In, in such a process, a lot of contamination occurs. Contamination of water with the feces, human excreta, is considered a very, very important cause. And it is also uh, a factor for zoonosis. That means, so a lot of uh, uh, spreading from animal species also occurs for this Cystosoma japanicum. That's why it is very, very dangerous. The male Cystosoma japanicum are 1.2 centimeters uh, in length and 0.5, uh, 0.5 millimeters in thickness. The females are measuring 2 centimeters. Say females are quite longer than male when compared in their length and uh, <coughs> females are a bit in, what is that called, um, um, they are very, they are having less diameter, 0.4 nanometer, 0.4 millimeter diameter. Okay, uh, one of the important feature is that Cystosoma japanicum is having a secondary host. The secondary host is Oncomelania species of nails. Okay. So here there is a small spelling mistake. This is a host, a secondary host. Cystosoma japanicum causes a characteristic uh, uh, disease that is called Katayama fever. Katayama fever is uh, uh, manifested with liver malfunctions, liver fibrosis, liver cirrhosis, and liver portal circulation hypertension, and the spleen get also damaged, the splenomegaly, spleen enlarges. So some of the eggs may pass to the liver and enter the lungs, nervous system and other organs where they can adversely affect the health of infected individual. So it is the most severe species among the three Cystosoma species. And the second species, Cystosoma mansoni. You can observe this slide here. Cystosoma mansoni photograph taken uh, by certain researchers. Well, I have mentioned here the, their address. So, the male is somewhat thick and the male is short and the female is completely accommodated in the male itself. This is female and this is male. Okay, Cystosoma mansoni occurs in the posterior mesenteric veins and it is spreading in African countries, Middle East, Caribbean, Brazil, Venezuela and Suriname. The adult lives in the blood vessels, especially the mesenteric veins near the human intestine. Okay. It causes intestinal cystosomiasis, intestinal cystosomiasis, and hepatic cystosomiasis. So, uh, like uh, Japanica, it is also causing intestinal or hepa hepatic cystosomiasis. You see, the speciality of this cystosoma is that both male and female are separate, actually. That means they are uh, unisexuals. Even though they are unisexual, they don't live totally separated from one another, they are attached permanently with one another. So, so such a condition is called copula or permanent wedded condition we say. So, permanent wedded condition means the female is living within a particular canal of male and the, such particular canal is called gynecophoric canal. The life cycle of the cystosoma mansoni includes two hosts. One is called a human being that is called the definitive host. Friends, I would like to explain one of the very, very important concepts 
why a host is called a definitive host. A host is considered as a definitive host because the host allows the parasite to complete its life, sexual life cycle. In whichever host the parasite completes its sexual life cycle, such a host is called definitive host. And in whichever host uh, the parasite uh, undergoes its larval development or its asexual development, such a host is called intermediate host. In this case, the intermediate host, which is a freshwater snail, this is called bioumpelaria, and it acts as the intermediate host. This is about uh, cystosoma mansoni, intestinal or hepatic uh, cystosomiasis it causes. Okay, let us now come on to our cystosoma hematobium. Cystosoma hematobium, as I mentioned, it lives in the pelvic veins which are very, very close to our urinary bladder. So it, it causes bladder cancer also. So that's why it is very important. So it is uh, occurring in African countries, in Middle East and in certain other areas. <clears throat> it is the only blood fluke that infects urinary tract, causing urinary cystosomiasis. Hepatic cystosomiasis and uh, intestinal cystosomiasis are the characteristic features of the other two species. And what is characteristic about cystosoma hematobium? It is urinary cystosomiasis and it is leading a very, very uh, uh, dangerous thing that is blood cancer. Okay, Billhurst, as I mentioned earlier, Theodore Billhurst discovered it and we will see the two individuals. You can see the slide on the right side. So the individual which is uh, seems to be very fat is called male individual and the very, very thin individual that is called female individual, female and male are uh, attached with one another, especially the female is lodged safely in a special canal called gynecophoric canal of male. So they live in a permanently paired condition or permanently wedded condition. Okay, So they appear in the pelvic veins and what is the definitive host? As I mentioned, definitive host is human being because it completes its life cycle, sexual life cycle in human being. Intermediate host is a freshwater snail here and that is Bullinus truncatus. Right. Okay, cystosoma hematobium morphology. Let us see the male form. Uh, <coughs> um, the, the, uh, the male form of platform, just to observe the male form, that means the body of male, the male form of platform. So it, it is measuring 10 to 18 millimeters in length and 1 millimeter in width. Okay. Whereas the female, you just observe the female, which is uh, quite thin and it is uh, longer than male and it is uh, 20 millimeters in length and only 0 0.25 uh, millimeters in width. Okay. So male is somewhat thicker and female is somewhat thin. Male is, uh, when compared to the length of the female, male is short and female is somewhat long. And the very important thing here we have to note is, if you can observe the male, uh, except uh, the anterior part and posterior part, the entire part of the male is flat, okay, it gets folded. When the flat body gets folded, this kind of fold is going to create a canal and that canal is useful for accommodating the female, hence the canal is called gynecophoric canal, gynecophoric canal. So actually, the, this is a flat worm. Flat helminthes uh, phylum includes all flat worms. All the worms are flat. Okay, so this flat body get folded. Okay, get curled because of this curling nature of both the sides. There is created a canal, and such canal is known as gynecophoric canal in which uh, the female is wrapped up. Okay, so it gives the general appearance of a cylindrical round worm, but it is not as a round worm. Only the anterior part and the posterior part are round and the rest of the body is almost all flat. On contrary to this, on contrary to male, the female is totally looks like a round worm because it is not flat at all. It is totally, its appearance is completely cylindrical just like uh, uh, a round worm. Okay, Only the extreme anterior and posterior part of the male <coughs> Uh, are uh, round, but whereas in female, the entire body is round. And you just observe, my friends, you, you just observe 
uh, the female worm, the female anterior part of the female as well as the posterior part of the female are exposed. The rest of the part is completely lodged inside the gynecophoric canal. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, I have drawn the life cycle of cystosoma hematobium. Uh, <clears throat> so let's see this uh, diagram. Life cycle. Cystosoma hematobium is a digenetic parasite. Digenetic parasite is that parasite which completes its life cycle in two hosts. What is the categorization of the host? A definitive host and intermediate host. Okay, the definitive host of cystosoma hematobium is human being. Because inside the human being, cystosoma can complete its sexual life cycle. Okay, so the intermediate host, the intermediate host is a snail. Intermediate host is a snail because inside the body of the snail, larval development occurs for the parasite and asexual reproduction goes on. So the definitive host is man and intermediate host is a snail. Let us see, whenever a healthy person comes in contact with a certain contaminated water, what happens? When a healthy person comes in, contamin comes in contact with the contaminated water, contaminated in the sense, in, in such contaminated water, all these infective stages are there. These infective stages are called circarial larvae. These circarial larvae will, will, will be converted into cystosomulae and they are ready to attach uh, to the skin of human being. So after attachment uh, onto the skin of human being, then they, they generally they are having certain penetration glands in their anterior part. They have oral suckers here you see. The oral sucker and ventral sucker are there. They attach to human being skin and gradually starts penetrating the skin. Okay, when the penetration is going on, a kind of a scratching sensation occurs, itching sensation occurs, okay? And they also liberate certain enzymes. What are the enzymes? Proteolytic enzymes. These infective stages, the circarial larvae of cystosoma, which are there in water, and whenever human comes in contact with the such contaminated water, comes in contact with the contaminated water, these circarial larvae first attach to the skin, and with, with their uh, oral suckers and they start releasing certain proteolytic enzymes. What's the function of the proteolytic enzymes? The proteolytic enzymes gradually start uh, digesting the proteins, especially the, uh, the area where hair follicle or uh, uh, hair uh, apertures are there or hair pores are there. So at that region, that is the uh, very convenient region for these uh, Circaria uh, infective stages to get enter into the body of human being. So, uh, at nearby the hair follicles or nearby the source of contact, uh, a, a kind of uh, itching sensation occurs. Often, this itching sensation uh, is called swimmer's itch. Many more times, when people swim in a particular water contaminated with uh, these larvae, after the swimming is completed, they start uh, scratching their body because of itch. Such an itch is known as a swimmer's itch. Okay. So after the attachment, uh, the tail of the circaria got removed and then they secrete proteolytic enzymes. They gradually go into the um, body and they reach the uh, capillaries. And from the capillaries, they go to the heart and from heart, uh, gradually they go to the liver, lungs, and other uh, very important areas. And from that particular area, <clears throat> okay, after uh, entering into the liver and from the portal wheel, from the, then they move towards uh, the pelvic region and settle nearby the uh, bladder region in the veins. Okay. Now, uh, after reaching to their destination, they take four to six weeks for, for, uh, uh, sex, for sexual maturity they'll attain their sexual maturity within four to six weeks and after the sexual maturity they start their new life cycle okay the these parasites especially the male and female individuals can survive for three to four years their lifespan is three to four years they can remain in our body okay now the adults are ready i mentioned that uh, uh, 
uh, male is having 10 to 8 millimeters and female is slightly longer than the male that is 20 millimeters in length and uh, male is completely flat female is uh, round okay the, the flat uh, part of the male get curled or folded to create a canal to lodge the female okay as we have already discussed the lifespan of uh, cystosoma hematobium adults is three to four years how much time does it take do they take to attain sexual maturity four to six weeks now the male and female are ready so the male and female are there in complete wedded condition permanent wedded condition called copula so they undergo copulation and as a result of copulation the sperms and eggs get mingled with one another and this is known as fertilization when fertilization is over then the female from its posterior part start laying eggs friends the eggs of cystosoma hematobium are very very special in what way they are special they are having small spines so they are having spines these are called spiny eggs these spiny eggs are liberated in the pelvic veins which are very close to urinary tract or urinary bladder okay so with the help of these uh, um, sp spines and other things they cause damage to the capillaries nearby the pelvic region and they get entered into urinary bladder this is the only way that they can escape from our uh, body into uh, the surrounding water so how do they escape simply they pass from the pelvic veins into the urinary bladder they get mingled with the urine and then when a person maturates passes the urine along with the urine all these uh, spiny eggs uh, go into the water and so now parasite has come out of uh, the body parasite means here it is there in the form of eggs adult parasites live there in the body but the eggs will come out of uh, uh, definitive host into water these uh, spiny eggs these spiny eggs they remain for 15 minutes in fresh water and immediately hatch out the eggs are now hatched out into the first stage larva of cystosoma hematobium the first larva of cystosoma hematobium is called a mirosidium it is called a mirosidium mirosidium looks like a tarvelarian you see you you will find ciliated epithelium like this for cilia, cilia are there ciliated epithelium it is useful for locomotion or swimming in water and uh, it is also having some penetration glands to get enter into its uh, next target that is secondary host snail and internal some structures are seen here like flame cells etc so for 15 minutes after 15 minutes eggs hatch out into these larvae the first stage larvae are called mirosidia okay mirosidia have certain time period okay so they have certain what is that called mitochondria like that they have certain energy sources in their body but these energy sources uh, will be uh, <clears throat> so, and, and, and they are uh, what is that called suitable only for 24 hours to 28 hours only within one day they have to reach their destination that is snail okay so otherwise uh, their energy sources get exhausted so uh, when uh, the 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 larva larva uh, has got no chance to enter into the snail the secondary host they immediately die so they have only a limited time of 24 hours to 28 hours because they they have got the energy sources very very limited now they swim in water in search of the secondary host that is snail for cystosoma hematobium uh, bullinus truncatus is the secondary host then the mirosidia penetrate into snail they reach the uh, liver liver part of the snail and gradually they are converted into the next stage the second stage larva is called sporocyst first stage larva is a mirosidium and the second stage larva is called sporocyst 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 here is called mother sporocyst because this sporocyst is having so many daughter sporocysts say 
half a million daughter sporosis are there in one mother sporosis actually only one egg sorry one zygote one zygote forms one egg one egg forms one mesocelium one mesocelium forms uh, one sporocyst but one sporocyst here is uh, going to form half a million 500000 of daughter sporosis only from one egg half a million parasites have come okay so this is called polyembryony polyembryony from only one zygote many embryos are formed and within one month after two weeks it start producing the daughter sporosis and after attaining one month of age it will come out of the snail and it transforms into the next stage larva the third stage larva is here called cercaria larva you will see the cercaria larva with a long tail that the long tail is having a characteristic fork fork forked tail and they are freely swimming in uh, fresh water with the help of their tails okay and they have the penetration glands they have oral suckers ventral suckers uh, and all the all their except the tail and this structure is looking like uh, what is that called cystosom a small cystosoma baby cystosoma now uh, <clears throat> they have some certain time limit what is the time limit four to six days their time limit here there is only what is the 24 to 28 hours but here four to six uh, uh, days of time is available for them to go into their target that their target is human being now whenever human comes in contact with the contaminated water with the help of the suckers they attach the human being with the help of penetration glands they start uh, penetrating the skin with the help of certain glands they secrete proteolytic enzymes the proteolytic enzymes dissolve the proteins in the hair follicles and get entered into the capillaries okay after entering into the capillaries what happens gradually they go to the circulation that means the heart from heart to liver and from liver to the portal veins portal veins are those veins which uh, or running between liver and intestine and gradually they go to their destination that is their pelvic region okay friends we are going to discuss uh, this this in another slide also you see this is uh, another slide prepared by cdc okay human gets a certain cercaria okay without a tail these are called cystosomulae and it enters into the uh, uh, region of our uh, intestine and large intestine small intestine and pelvic region all these capillaries are uh, infected with these uh, parasites now this is this adult male and female they get copulated they are remaining in the permanent wed wedded condition and then these are the mirasidia of three different species cystosoma hematobium cystosoma japonicum and cystosoma mansoni mirasidium is forming and uh, these mirasidia these are the x and this is mirasidium these mirasidia they search their uh, uh, intermediate host and they develop in the liver of that intermediate host into sporocyst mother sporocyst produces daughter sporosis and uh, these daughter sporosis transform into cercaria larvae and these cercaria larvae is infected friends you need to observe one thing that in this life cycle there is no radia there is no metacercaria radia stage and metacercaria stage are absent what are the disease symptoms the disease is known as cystosomiasis very easily we can recognize with the help of itching sensation after having contacted with uh, after having a contact with uh, water and this is called swimmers itch and the spiny x cause of bleeding and uh, this is called a hemorrhage so this hemorrhage is called a, a urinary hemorrhage actually and the x which are there in the blood vessels if they don't go outside they cause a small abscesses abscesses a wound like structures and some tumor like fibrosis and it causes hepatitis it causes diarrhea it causes anemia and it is having the symptoms of eosinophilia symptoms of hepatitis diarrhea anemia eosinophilia these are all the symptoms but how to diagnose traditional diagnose is made by examination of x in the urine but it is very very difficult to do that because we have to collect the urine we have to see the eggs this is a very difficult procedure and the very easy procedure is antigen testing okay so we have an antigen called cystosome antigen when we inject the cystosome antigen uh, in into our skin in the hypodermal region 
a small bulge comes outside this is uh, uh, this is called a small raising of the skin if the raising of the skin is there uh, immediately uh, we can say that it is having cystosoma in the body so this is antigen test and what is the main cause the main cause is uh, contaminating water source with the dumping of human waste this is the main cause okay and what to do we need to have hygienic disposal of waste materials and whenever we need to use water for bathing or for uh, uh, drinking anything we need to uh, take precautionary steps of boiling the water in the endemic region in those regions where the disease is very very prevalent and the infested water should be avoided and it is very very difficult sometimes to stop the infection because most of the people are practicing their agriculture and this agriculture water is already contaminated with the human excreta because in certain areas uh, using human excreta as a fertilizer is a practice in such a area in such an area it is it is very very difficult to prevent the disease and the better way is to eradicate the snail species because snail is the secondary host if you can remove the secondary host definitely we don't get the infection okay so treatment is also available certain anti antimony compounds anti malarial drugs are also uh, showing its effect okay uh, <clears throat> oxaminiquin and uh, proziquantel proziquantel has got several side effects calcium uh, channel blockers are there but uh, most of the drugs are causing side effects to human beings because they are toxic or they may be very very expensive that's why people don't want to use that and if we need uh, a patient needs long term treatment these are all uh, what is that called hurdles in the treatment of uh, uh, in the in the eradication of this parasite that's why it is the most neglected disease and one thing we need to understand that whatever drug that you take the drug is first uh, absorbed or are uh, entering into liver and liver will modify the drug liver does not allow the drug to go into a particular area that's why whenever there is involvement of the liver it's very difficult to treat any kind of disease because liver takes any foreign material and changes because of this change the drug will lose its effectiveness efficacy so sometimes the adults migrate to liver because the liver is the safe area where drugs are ineffective so this these are all certain hurdles you see these this is in this case if this is the situation who can stop the uh, infection it's very very difficult okay okay friends uh, these parasites especially <clears throat> the platyhelminth parasites are are having certain adaptations we can categorize adaptations into three types structural adaptations physiological adaptations and reproductive adaptations structural adaptations are those adaptations which which we observe in the structure of the body especially uh, you see presence of suckers and presence of hooks uh, acetabula and then what is that called uh, the body outer layer of the body is very very hard that is called cuticle and sometimes it is called tegument and absence of digestive system you, you know because these parasites are living in the area where uh, uh, food is there that's why absence of any digestive system because food is already digested outside why to take it and digest again there is no need they directly absorb the digested food and this is known as osmotrophy locomotory organs are not at all necessary because they have they are lodged safely in our body so locomotory organs are absent attachment organs called hollow old fast organs are there and body size is very much reduced sense organs are reduced nervous system is reduced because there is no use there is no uh, use of seeing this this side and that side because uh, our entire uh, inner part of the body is completely dark so no photoreceptors no sound receptors like that the sense organs are completely uh, degenerated and the body is dorsoventrally flat only to reduce the friction and the muscular pharynx is there for proper attachment and physiological adaptations they secrete some uh, molecules like anti enzymes and they are able to take uh, anaerobic pathway whenever oxygen is not available okay digestion activity is completely uh, uh, reduced 
or degraded and they are resistant to the toxins secreted by uh, the host body and they are able to escape the immunological action. They are changing their antigens time to time and sometimes they confuse host immunity also. They can kill the host immune cells. Okay, So the um, osmotic balance uh, is already maintained and food storage is not necessary. Osmosis is not necessary because uh, both the concentrations are same in and out. And uh, any parasite is having very, very important adaptations in their uh, reproductive system, in its reproductive. High fecundity rate is there and mostly they are hermaphroditic nature. But uh, in the case unisexuals are there, they are, they are present very in closed condition like uh, uh, wetted condition. And then tinea, solium, if you can see, it releases 35,000 of eggs a day, very high rate of uh, egg production. Faciola releases 10,000 eggs per day. Ascaris is uh, reaching its climax, 2 lakhs eggs per day. And uh, they are having cystic stages to tide over the unfavorable conditions. And they are having complex life cycles. Okay, friends, I have collected all this uh, information and the photographs, images uh, from the internet source. So, because uh, it is used for the education purpose of uh, government degree colleges, okay, public public funded education systems and these are the references. Thank you friends. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you.